All right, I'm still a few people joining, but uh, we're a minute past the hour, so I'll go ahead and get started. So it's my pleasure uh, to welcome everybody back after our, our summer hiatus uh, to the ArcUC seminar series. And it's uh, also my pleasure to introduce Professor James Whitfield from Dartmouth College. Hi, we'll be speaking with us today on uh, fermion encodings and simulation of quantum chemistry. Could, we please, could I please ask those who are not muted to mute your microphone? might be able to. Thank you. Um, so uh, Professor Whitfield graduated from Morehouse College and obtained his doctorate in chemical physics from Harvard in 2011. And after a postdoctoral fellowship at the Vienna Center for Quantum Science and Technology, he joined the faculty at Dartmouth College, where he is now as an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and also an adjunct faculty in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, as we'll see today, Professor Whitfield and his group work on novel computing approaches to electronic structure with an emphasis on physical simulations using quantum computers. And he's also very active in the community, in, quantum, in the quantum education community, serves on the advisory board at the IBM HBCU Quantum Center and at Qubit by Qubit, and also currently an Amazon visiting academic. So James, uh, thank you very much for joining us and for giving the talk today. Uh, I'll briefly mention before we flip over to your slides that uh, next up next month, uh, we're excited to have uh, Lorenzo Viola who will be speaking at this, and I just want to make a note to everybody that uh, this will be my last time hosting this seminar. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Greg Kiros will be taking over the communications for the seminar series, and so watch for announcements from Greg. It'll be through the same um, uh, through the same listserv, but there will be a new Zoom link. So just uh, make sure you watch for that. And the current one will no longer work after today. So uh, James, I will uh, stop sharing and uh, let you take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the uh, for the great introduction, everyone. Hopefully, you can see me. Let's see here. Okay, I'm both uh, I'm very excited to give this talk. Um, I have some new things to share. Okay, I'm not going to get the quantum supremacy, but I think that's okay. Um, I'm also very excited about the number of people who are watching this talk. I, I got a lot of emails from friends just saying uh, that they'll be here, um, and so let me uh, share my slides. I think after all this time on Zoom, I'd be a little more efficient, but uh, bear with me. So, start loading. Yeah, so just to kind of set the stage for what we're gonna talk about today, we to talk about spin to fermion transforms. This is something I've been working on since I showed up at Dartmouth and even earlier. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about is some of the newer results that we have. Some, some new results, in fact, that I haven't even discussed with anyone in my group, only one person in my group so far. Um, they're, they're small results, but it'll hopefully set the stage for much larger results. And they're based on a lot of work that we've done over the past few years. So, uh, so uh, Okay. Are we seeing the same screen? That's seeing a black a black screen at the moment. Black screen. Oh no. Okay. It says James Whitfield has started screen sharing. <laughs> Try it again. You can see it now. There we go. Yep. Okay. Excellent. There are not 54 slides. Uh, the appendix command did not work as expected. However, um, nonetheless, we're going to talk our way through what I hope is about a 30, 45 minute journey through fermionic encodings and simulation of quantum chemistry. It'll actually be much broader than quantum chemistry. Quantum chemistry will be uh, 
almost a side step inside of this inside this path and journey that we're going to talk through. We're going to really think about fermionic encodings quite broadly. We're going to think about what it means to encode an anti-symmetric space and what it means to have a quantum computer at all. So with that in mind, let's start off with this discussion of uh, what does it mean to have a quantum computer at all? Um, and then we will talk about consequences of indistinguishability. Uh, so this is really interesting. A lot of work's been going on about indistinguishable particles. So those on sampling, free fermion simulations, these things all, all come into play instead of some nice ways. Um, our group uh, has, and along with our collaborators, have a number of works on computational complexity. So if that's of something of interest to you, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Don't mind questions. There's a lot of things I can't get to inside of an hour. So feel free to derail me. I'm happy to go off on any tangent that you guys find interesting. Um, and what we're gonna try and make it to is a discussion of local fermionic encodings. So these local fermionic encodings, um, we had a paper that came out uh, late last year about um, custom fermion codes. And these custom fermion codes end up having a lot of connections to what basis set you're using. And so I'll wrap up the entire talk with the discussion of basis sets and some models that we are um, working on now, or we will be working on uh, very shortly. So first to kind of set the stage, um, my group's in the physics department. Um, we work on physics as well as quantum chemistry. Um, we use computers to do so and quantum technology is why we're all here. So what is quantum technology? Quantum technology is technology that translates from quantum mechanics to quantum engineering. And I think this is kind of a nice joke because we always teach quantum mechanics, but now we need quantum engineers. So you can think of a mechanic as the person who fixes the car and the engineer is the one who builds the car. And so if we think of the same dichotomy, we're thinking of teaching engineering, right? We wanna teach how to use quantum mechanics to do things. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I do a lot of things around education. So that's a little shout out to that hat that I wear. Um, the, the nature of what we're trying to do here is to use computers, um, which is quite a broad word. So computers are originally people. Uh, so it's a person who reckons, a device that reckons that computes. Um, and this is to illustrate the fact that we can think about a lot of things before they exist. So we think of quantum computers before we actually have large scale quantum devices, we have a lot of small scale quantum computers. Um, and then we're thinking about physics and some of our research, but we're thinking about the nature of natural things. How does things connect to uh, the bigger world? How do we understand how to use these computers? There's a huge industry evolving around this. Um, I'm involved with some of these companies, at various levels. Uh, there's a lot of you guys who are involved with companies at various levels that are interacting with companies, maybe testing devices from certain companies, INQ, D-Wave, um, you know, uh, Zapata is building quantum software, QBraid's building quantum educational material, Amazon, uh, IBM, Microsoft are all building large scale quantum devices or, or have efforts to do so. Um, so this just is a global effort to pushing towards quantum computing. Um, and this global effort is also seeded by a lot of governments from Canada to the United States to um, India, China, Aus Russia, Australia. And so all around the world, there's a big global push for quantum information science. Um, this is organized by the DOE. So we're here in the Department of Energy. Um, so this is also part of the United States push for um, dominance of the quantum information science arena. Um, why is everyone interested? Um, we're all interested in this notion of quantum co computation. Um, because we have quantum computers that can solve problems. Um, these problems that quantum computers solve are inside of a complexity class called BQP, which stands for Bounded Error Quantum Polynomial Time. This is a class of problems that can be solved easily by a computer with quantum resources. By easily, this means in polynomial time. So as the input size doubles, the amount of time I should wait should be some polynomial of the number two. If the input size multiplies by 10, then it should be um, a polynomial of whatever the a polynomial in the number 10. And so the idea is that we have it scaling not exponentially, but polynomially with um, our resources. This is a, a notion of universal quantum computer. We need some way of initializing the device, some way of uh, giving some commands to, or a quantum algorithm set of instructions for this quantum device to execute. And then at the final step, we need to do a measurement and read out that information. Um, this is a very general paradigm. There's a lot of details here, DiVincenzo criteria, how do you actually build the bit? All these questions in discussion um, can all, uh, well, I'll come back to that in a second. But um, what is next here is discuss this notion of, of, um, of the, what BQP can do. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, and what BQP can do. So these BQP target areas, um, sometimes you have exponential speed up, sometimes you have 
some polynomial, maybe exponential speed ups, and we have polynomial speed ups. So in the bottom is MP complete problems. Um, these MP complete problems where we really need to search through every possible solution. We only get a quadratic speed up. This is Grover's search speed up. This is also seen inside of a lot of the efforts to um, improve sampling. So the Heisenberg the standard uh, quantum limit and the Heisenberg limit. You can also see this also as a manifestation of what happens when you're doing um, spin squeezed measurements and you get also quadratic speed up. Um, so a lot of the quadratic speed ups show up here inside this bottom um, section of polynomial uh, speed ups. Um, optimization problems, I say mix because there's a lot of quantum heuristics, a lot of machine learning, which is also built on heuristics, where it's not as easy to prove that there's an actual separation between quantum and classical. However, at the top of this list is quantum evolution. Quantum evolution gives us what we think is an exponential speed up over a classical computation. Um, we think it's an exponential speed up because we don't know how to do the classical simulation efficiently. This quantum evolution um, through uh, formulations like the product formula, um, quantum signal processing, Taylor expansions, many, many techniques that are being developed um, at both at the national labs and around the country and around the world about how do we do better quantum simulation. Um, these are typically interested in improving certain factors but the core essence of all the quantum evolution algorithms to the quantum simulation time, the amount of time the quantum device takes is proportional to the amount of time you simulated. And this is really the crux of why anyone cares about BQP to quantum evolution, um, is that we can do this time evolution proportional to the amount of time we wanna evolve under. Okay, so hopefully this is pretty much uh, cut and dry for everyone. Uh, I think what I'd like to kind of start to see this, this, this talk a little bit, um, to center the talk a little bit more around fermions, is starting to think about how do we connect quantum computation to physics, right? And how do we connect quantum computation to chemistry? And there's this beautiful quote going back to 1929 from Dirac, where he says, the underlying laws necessary for mathematical theory of a large part of physics and a whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. So this quote here says that we have the mathematical theory we need, um, the problem is that we can't solve these equations, and this entire conversation is seated around the Schrodinger um, equation. So Schrodinger equation contains a lot of information that I won't go through the details. If you, if you, you should um, have some sense of, of, of how that connects, and if you don't, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it as we go through. Um, one word on notation here, the capital letter N will, throughout the entire talk, represent the number of electrons um, inside of some fermionic Hamiltonian inside of some interactions and in some systems interacting. We have some kinetic energy term, which is represented by T, some potential energy, scalar potential energy represented by V, and some two-body interaction represented by W. These uh, terms inside your Hamiltonian, these could be spin terms, these could be fermionic terms, could be bosonic terms, it could be any sort of terms you want, but this is going to describe some physical system, some physical qubit that we have. It's going to describe the quantum gates that we can use to do that time evolution. Um, the Hamiltonian does not describe measurement for a variety of reasons that get into the foundation of quantum mechanics. Um, but nonetheless, this is gonna dictate the physical properties of that quantum system and how it's going to evolve. Um, and we wanna use this ability to simulate system with qubits, quantum gates and measurements to understand the equation, to understand the physics. We understand the physics, then we can understand the equation and build better quantum computers. So you get this virtuous cycle of building better quantum computers, understanding the physics, understanding the chemistry better, building better systems, and you get this nice loop inside of Schrodinger's conversation piece. So I like to set the stage for how physics connects to computation with this, uh, this, this circular metaphor. Okay. So it's kind of a broad overview of what uh, the, the, the thought area that we're in is. And now we're gonna zoom in to some consequences for indistinguishable particles. My group works on fermionic uh, simulations. So this is quite broad. We're thinking about how we can use novel methods of computation to understand, um, to understand particles in the world around us. Okay, so let us return to this Hamiltonian that I wrote down in the beginning. Now we're going to turn to this Hamiltonian, but we're going to think about what happens when we have a permutation on that Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian, um, as it was listed, you can see here it's permutation invariant because we're summing over all possible combinations of i and j. So this, this um, two-body interaction includes all pairs. Um, each one of these includes all um, individual coordinates. And so if we act with some permutation operator on the left and right, then we're just permuting these coordinates. So um, pi i would be what um, the ith element maps to under some permutation pi. 
pi is from the symmetric group over n objects. Again, there's n electrons. And so as we commute this thing, you can see, or not you can see, but you should believe, trust, know um, that this Hamiltonian is invariant under permutations because we included all possible permutations. So what's really nice, as you know from elementary quantum mechanics, when we have operators that commute with our Hamiltonian, this gives us a symmetry group that we can use to block diagonalize our Hamiltonian. And this is what we call symmetry adapting. Um, and in the case of symmetry adapted for a quantum system, for, for systems that have invariant symmetries, then we have a number of different blocks that are labeled by these young frames, um, representation theory, lots of very beautiful things there that uh, if you're interested, we can talk about. Um, but I think it's not as widely known as would be needed for a nice discussion. Um, one thing that I would like to highlight inside this discussion, if you know anything about group theory, and if you don't, it's also okay. Um, so the representations of the symmetric group, uh, the symmetric group always has two one-dimensional representations. There's an anti-symmetric alternating representation and the symmetric or trivial representation of the permutation group. Okay, there's a bunch of other representations in between, but for all uh, symmetric groups, what, no matter what n is, there's always symmetric subspace and the anti-symmetric subspace. Um, and, and we label this with A and S to kind of prime your mind to think about anti-symmetric and symmetric. And this is really where we get to with bosons and fermions. Okay, so uh, the title of this section was about identical particles and what makes, uh, what are the consequences of being indistinguishable? So first let us start off with what does it mean for them to be identical quantum objects? That means that if I, uh, so just backing up and saying what it means to have identical particles. Um, one of the important aspects of uh, design and engineering was having screws that were identical, you know, being able to machine parts to the necessary precision such that they become indistinguishable. And that if you have um, an automobile and one of the bolts falls out, well, you can find another bolt that matches that and put it back in. And that bolt can be interchanged with any other bolt as long as they're indistinguishable bolts. Okay. So that means that the permutation of bolt A and bolt B should do nothing to our system. So we're gonna make this mathematically um, by taking our quantum state here, we're gonna take density matrices um, as, our, as our fundamental definition of a quantum state. We'll talk about wave functions throughout, but um, I think the correct way to think of quantum states is always as a density matrix. If you think of this density matrix and you can act with the permutation again on the left and right. And we'd expect that if we do some permutation over identical particles, we get back the same exact state. This will be possible if the permutation acting on the left on eigenvector uh, psi k and writing acting on the, the right with uh, psi, eigenvector psi k gives back some number that multiplies back out to one, okay? Um, this is not sufficient for dividing things into bosons and fermions. Of course, there's anions. Anions is, a, is gonna be an entirely different group, uh, the braid group rather than symmetric group. Um, but here we only get bosons and fermions because the only irreducible representations of the symmetric group um, that correspond to one dimension is the alternating anti-symmetric representation and the symmetric or uh, trivial bosonic representation. So these are the two subspaces that are one dimensional. Otherwise we have to use more than one copy of the rep uh, more than one carrier in order to represent the, the problem. So this is really, I think, a better argument as to why you have completely symmetric and completely anti-symmetric, and you don't have mixed symmetries where perhaps permutation between particle one and five gives a minus sign, but permutation between particles seven and eight gives a plus sign, which would be compatible with a lot of the, the more trivial arguments about why these two things divide into bosons and fermions. I don't know how digestible that is, but if you've seen some representation theory, hopefully this helps you appreciate the physics. If you've seen a lot of physics, hopefully this helps you appreciate a bit of representation theory. Okay, so um, taking that a bit further. So I mentioned there's these two spaces, the anti-symmetric subspace and the symmetric subspace. We can project into these two subspaces using projection operators. We have an anti-symmetric projector and a symmetric projector. And to give a little more of a sense of what's going on here, the symmetric projector, we have all these permutations getting the representation for the permutation, which is just, the idea, just trivial. So that means that every single permutation operator is just identified with the number one. So the multiplication table satisfied in some trivial way. Um, and then for the anti-symmetric subspace, we use the sign of the permutation. The sign of the permutation is whether it's composed of an even number of transpositions or an odd number of transpositions. And this is uniquely determined. Um, so the sign of the permutation is gonna be, uh, is gonna be uh, fixed. 
And we're summing over all the signs of permutations, and then we're acting with that permutation on the coordinates of the system. This gives back the well-known Slater determinant. So we have a bunch of single particle functions, phi um, sub k1, and then we have a bunch of single partner, particle coordinates, x1, x2, and xn. We combine this and we get back this uh, anti-symmetric object, the, the, the determinant. We swap two columns, we get a minus sign. We swap two rows, we get a minus sign. Swapping two columns is corresponding to swapping orbitals, and swapping two rows is corresponding to swapping uh, is swapping two rows is corresponding to swapping orbitals. Swapping two columns corresponds to swapping two electronic coordinates. Okay. In both cases, we want to get a minus sign. Uh, and for the bosonic situation, we have the same game, except now instead of having the sign of the permutation, we have nothing. It's just identity. Um, what's important to note here, and, and I think this will be the first time we'll highlight this, is this n factorial term is a very large number. So the factorial function grows uh, very, very quickly. And so you see this is gonna sum over a large number of terms if we evaluate either summation, this one or this one. Okay. So one of the important differences between these two summation formulas is that the summation in the determinant case is related to the eigenvalues of the matrix whose determinant you're trying to compute. Whereas in permanent, this is not related to eigenvalues at all. The only way to compute the permanent is to actually go through all in factorial elements of the symmetric group and actually do the products and the, and the, and the summations. So this means that it's um, exponentially costly. Um, you have to be careful. This is not sufficient to say that it's, it's uh, for, for making statements about the complexity of linear optics. You need to be a little more concrete about how hard it is to approximate the permanent. And that's where you start to get into these computational complexity arguments that Aronson and Arkhipov put down in 2013. Um, in 2001, thinking about non-interacting particles, um, there was this very beautiful discussion that opens up around the early 2000s um, between uh, Keneal, um, Bravi, uh, Ter Terhal and DiVincenzo, uh, Leslie Valiant, all these uh, authors were computing to this concept of non-interacting systems. So when we have fermions that are non-interacting, then we get a very nice way of simulating them by only keeping track of certain types of objects. And this is this paper, Classical Simulation of Non-Interacting Fermionic Quantum Circuits. These are also called match gates. So if you've come across inside of another context, non-interacting fermions is, is essentially equivalent to the match gate formulation of, um, of, quantum, of quantum circuits. Bosons have been in the news for um, the last few years. A lot of people are thinking about doing quantum supremacy. Um, if you um, allow certain um, um, uh, states to be generated, uh, you can actually generate um, a, a universal quantum computation for linear um, optics. Now, if you don't allow for certain states, you leave them non-interacting, you can still get a simplified model of, of computation, which is boson sampling, that's still known to be hard for classical computers. Okay, so this is the major difference. Free fermions are easy to, to simulate, Free bosons are not easy to simulate and it comes down to this difference in the permanent and determinant. Nonetheless, we're gonna focus all of our attention on fermions. We're not gonna deal with free fermions, but we'll deal with fermions that have interactions. Um, and what that's gonna require us to do in both cases, whether they're dealing with fermions or bosons is encode this wave function in a way that the qubits are anti-symmetric. The qubits have lost their distinguishability properties. And we're gonna do this through a number of algebraic methods. And uh, to set the stage for this, uh, to start off with just reminders of what the qubit algebra is. Qubit algebra, we get these poly matrices. So we have our sigma x operator, our sigma y operator, sigma z operators. And these correspond to uh, these different axes along the block sphere. Um, and you can imagine doing some rotations of the block sphere. And this is corresponds to doing some rotation using the rx, ry, rz gate. Um, there's some algebraic properties these matrices satisfy. And in fact, if we had another set of matrices that also satisfied this algebra, then that would be fine to use those instead. On the fermion side, we have creation annihilation operators, which is a whole discussion in and of itself. But nonetheless, there's a fermionic algebra and a qubit algebra. And you can see that these algebraic relations between X and Y, this is the commutator. Um, it's not the same as anti-commutator relations between um, these creation annihilation operators. Okay, so let me unpack the creation annihilation operators a bit in case you have not seen it. Um, 
So uh, just reiterating, uh, we have this, this spin and fermion algebras. In the fermionic algebra, we have what's called a creation and annihilation operators. Um, and this electronic systems include uh, semiconductors, chemistry, material science. Um, you have density functional theory. You have exact diagonalization. You have methods using green functions. You have a lot of different approaches to approaching fermionic systems, electronic problems. And these, these go back to the 1920s. Um, and e probably even early if you start talking about what chemists were doing with these notions of uh, electrons. Um, so this anti-commutator um, says that I'm going to take object A and object B, and I'm going to take that plus object B and object A. And this is just an um, anti-commutation relation. And for, um, for fermions, we have this anti-annihilation, anti-commutation relation equal to zero when they're both removing a particle. And this A dagger will add a particle to your vacuum state. And this A dagger anti-commutes with um, the uh, destruction operator at the same site. And so these are electrons here. Uh, my electrons in my head are always very happy creatures. They don't have anything to be concerned about. They have no politics. They have no internal structure. So why not be happy? Um, and so we have the electrons as particular coordinates. Our electrons also will have spin up, spin down. And so you can really think of this as a copy of two grids. And you could think AI corresponds to this location spin down, and AI plus one corresponds to this location spin up. And you can think of ordering them in different ways. But nonetheless, I have some set of electrons here. And they are created and annihilated into these locations using these operators. Um, the qubit uh, algebra is going to function quite a bit differently. Nonetheless, our goal will be to map one algebra to the other. And I have a large number of ways of discussing this. And what we're going to narrow our, our talk towards is doing local excitations, so local simulations of fermions with our qubit operators. Um, okay. And before we go there, first let us take a slight detour here and talk about first and second quantization. So these are two major um, thought areas about how to encode an antisymmetric subspace onto a set of qubits. So the first way that we can do so is keeping in copies of the lattice, each with one electron inside that copy. Okay, so this is saying that I have uh, register one and I have the first, I have electron one at the first location, I have electron two at the third location. And then I'm gonna anti-symmetrize this by taking this state minus the swapped version of it. And we're gonna do that by making sure that the coefficients in front of each one of these terms inside of our large summation is anti-symmetric. So we're going to keep an anti-symmetric tensor in front of this object that is m raised to the n, m being the number of points that we have, and n being the number of electrons that we have. In second quantization, we're going to do something different. We're now we're going to keep one copy of the lattice, and we're going to keep n electrons, but now we're going to have m locations. Here, this is actually n log m. Um, we can be a little more intelligent about how we encode one and how we encode three. Um, nonetheless, uh, the ideas should be hopefully clear that here we're going to um, have second quantization where everybody goes inside the same um, lattice. And then we have first quantization where everybody gets their own copy of the lattice. And we're going to anti-symmetrize all the copies. Okay. So just building up a little bit more um, off of what, what we said in the, in the previous slide. Um, we can think about this, this action of a permutation. So we talked about permutation in the beginning. So here, instead of a permutation, we have x goes to minus x, and this is just x cubed. Um, if x goes to minus x and x cubed goes from x cubed to minus x cubed, right? So this is saying that we pick up a minus sign every time we perform this action of x going to minus x. We want the same thing for whenever we perform a swap of coordinate xi and xj. We want to pick up a minus sign. And we're going to do so one of two ways. We can do that by explicitly acting with the permutation. So we actually have some way of permuting register I with register J. And we can do this by, you know, actually doing some actual set of gates that will swap these. Um, and this would be um, applying an actual anti-symmetrizer. If you need to apply this anti-symmetrizer that I would act with every single one of these permutations with their sign, and you end up with some coefficients in front of all the different states. So each X1, X2, Xn is inside their own register. And then it's anti-symmetrized over all the registers. On the other hand, second quantization, we're going to do this by an implicit action. So now a representation of our group is, is either, of every permutation is either plus one or minus one. So if we permute um, orbital i and orbital j, 
Well, it's going to move this string of accretion annihilation operators out of order, and then we're going to move them back. We move them back. We pick up the minus sign, which is the implicit, which is the representation of this uh, permutation operator. So what you can think is that the difference between first and second quantization. The first quantization, there's no canonical ordering. You just put down all the all the objects, and then you do the anti-symmetrization, and then you end up with some anti-symmetrized combination at the end. In second quantization, however, you get this very deep connection between uh, the permutation group and linear objects. So a lot of the efforts that people have shown that quantum com um, where quantum computers can solve problems, you really rely on linearity on one-dimensional systems. These one-dimensional systems are very nice because laying out wh which or orbital goes with which location makes a lot of sense. Um, just one, one other note about labeling the modes one to n, um, I remember when my daughter was learning how to count, and it's really interesting if you ever watch a child learn how to count objects, it's actually not a trivial mapping to make sure you didn't count the same object twice. So you see them count three pennies, and they count penny one, penny two, penny three, penny four, penny five, penny six, and you're like, <laughs> you, know, you did this mapping in some very nonsensical way. But you can see that learning the mapping from a set of objects in three space to a linear list of one, two, three, four, five, is not a trivial thing to do. It requires some memory, it requires some thought and planning and layout. And so you can see this show up when we try and use a permutation group to represent um, anti-symmetric objects. It would really require some planning and thinking about what order do we actually put the orbitals in. Okay, um, that's a lot of uh, um, introduction. Hopefully, uh, maybe we should pause here and just see if there's any questions. I don't know, we've been through a lot of material. Um, we're about halfway through the talk. So uh, any questions so far? or comments? Okay, well, if there are, feel free to type them in the chat. Um, certainly happy to hear questions if you guys have any, any tangents or anything else. Okay, going once, going twice. All right. Um, I I have a comment. Great. Um, so these two um, approaches, the explicit and the implicit, um, as far as it applies to quantum um, computing, what I am gathering is that the second quantization is is a way that we can't because we take advantage of the linearity. Um, and can encode it in a quantum computer. Is that right? Um, close. You can, you can encode both ways into, into a quantum computer. Um, it's just going to be very different approaches to how you encode them. Okay. Often, sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm Mina. I'm actually a graduate student with University of Tennessee, and I work with an advisor at Oak Ridge <laughs> National Lab. Um, I often see in the quantum chemistry papers that they they prefer um, working with the second quantization and then going with the Jordan Wigner or the yeah. Brad Jay transformation over the, the, first, the first quantization method. Um, is that because I also tend to focus on the circuit model? Would that be a different quantum computer where you would use the first quantization over the second? So, so no, um, I can say a little bit about why most of the literature is focused on second quantization. So for second quantization, um, so all right. So the main difference between first and second quantization is really in the simulation method. So in the simulation method, people came up with for first quantization really relied on being able to take um, this instead of having orbital phi m orbital phi j, you're actually having location x m and x j, and you're able to compute the difference between coordinate x one and x two in order to compute the Coulomb interaction. Okay. Um, so, so the reason that that works, or the reason that could work, and we'll talk about this a bit more as we get into the talk, is because you use something that's very close to a lattice. So we're on a lattice, it makes sense to talk about an orbital um, one being localized at some point in, in R3 and some other orbital two being localized at some other point inside of R3, and you're computing the distance between these two points. Um, and so if you do this and you take a simulation approach that takes that method, then you really need a lot of points in order to represent anything accurately. Right. Not even a super large number of points, but you need a large number of points to represent anything accurately. 
Uh, with second quantization, it's much easier to use a basis set and in, in, um, where you have something that's delocalized like an STO, like an, uh, like an S orbital or P orbital or D orbital, where you don't really have to talk about the electron being localized to one position in R3, really talking about some distribution that the electrons localized into. Uh, right. Okay. That makes, I, I follow. Yeah. So it comes down to the basis set, and we'll, we'll see this reappear. It's a very nice to ask the question now because we'll see the same discussion reappear again. Um, but if you look at the first quantization, it's really um, it, the reason that it kind of fell out of disfavor is that it requires using this lattice basis, and we'll see that that that's probably not a big deal um, in 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 some senses. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, I'm glad to help. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It makes me feel like I'm not here alone on Zoom. So yeah, thanks. I hear you. Okay, all right, so um, taking that and moving forward, um, I'm just gonna say very little um, about different algebraic spin fermion transforms. There's a large number of them. Um, our group was the group that identified Fenwick trees as being a nice way of capturing a lot of the encodings. Fenwick trees, if you don't know them, uh, feel free to type into Google, um, uh, Fenwick tree top coder. And there's beautiful tutorials about how Fenwick trees are applied inside of a lot of uh, problems inside of computer science. Um, the problems inside of computer science, or quote unquote computer science that we're looking at here, and uh, this goes back to Bravi Katev um, even earlier where they had something very similar to the Fenwick tree mapping, of course, after Peter Fenwick. But uh, the idea of the Fenwick tree is that you're able to encode both the occupancy and a prefix sum. So adding up all the, all the numbers in, before it. So this is useful for a number of different database encodings and, and areas inside of computer science where you need to do certain types of encodings. Of information. But this also shows up when we talk about Jordan Wigner, who's already mentioned so the last question. There's a lot of really beautiful transforms here that we put a lot of effort into. And I'm going to um, not go deeply into details here. And, and please forgive me if you want to know more about this or work in this area, please let me know. Um, but the idea here is that for each qubit, we're going to associate the occupancy. So whether site NI is occupied or unoccupied, it's just going to be represented by qubit state one and qubit state zero. And then we do that, we just get some very nice mapping from our creation annihilation operators to a set of poly operators. These poly operators are going to create annihilate according to the algebra AJ, AJ dagger, AK, AK dagger, and all these different algebraic properties we satisfied by this transformation. Okay, I'm assuming this is hopefully relatively trivial. And I'll say there's a lot of other mappings that we could get in details about. But um, in the interest of time and making sure we get to where I want to get to, um, we're going to just kind of ball those all up and say there's a lot of mappings that end up. Uh, so I should note here that all the mappings that, that could have been discussed here, Bravi Katev, different types of Fenwick trees, the ternary tree encoding, all these encodings, um, or swap networks even, all these encodings have this extensive part. So for all J, for, so if I'm creating a fermion at, at site J, or uh, annihilating from me on site J, I need to touch all of the qubits K less than J. So this means that I'm touching an extensive number of qubits at every, at every time, right? For the Bravi Katev, you get a logarithmic number, but it still grows with the system size. For ternary tree, you touch every qubit every time. Uh, and for um, a number of other methods, you just end up touching a non-local number of sites. And so I'll just group them all as non-local transformations and you can think about it however you want. And if you have questions, please just, you know, ping me and I'll tell you more. But hey, James, really, hopefully a quick question. Can you, what's the intuition there for why you have to touch all those? Um, so the intuition, the easiest intuition to see here is if you touch all of them because there's, you need to lose track of who's who. You need to lose track uh, of who's who. And so the way that you're losing track of who's who, um, there's a variety of different ways you're losing track of who's who, but you can think that another answer that the, I guess might have popped inside of someone else's head is that this, this, this prefix um, product here is a way of keeping track of what the sign should be when I do this permutation. So this is telling me whether, so each Z operator is going to say, if you act with Z on, on, um, on an unoccupied site, then you're going to get back a plus one. If you act with Z on an occupied site, you're going to get it back a minus one. And so the idea is I'm taking a product of all the occupancies raised to the minus one, or minus one raised to the number of occupancies. And that's how you're getting the non-local behavior here for the jordan Wigner mapping. For the other mappings, you need to keep track of both the, the phase factor as well as the occupancy. You need to update the occupancy and update the phase factors appropriately. Thank you. Yeah, of course. 
Um, all right, now we're gonna do to close out the talk. Uh, we're coming down the home stretch, 20 minutes left. So hopefully this will get us to a nice place. I wanna talk about local fermion encoding. This is something that we've been studying here at Dartmouth. Um, uh, the initial point of contact and local fermionic encodings. So as I mentioned in the previous section is that there's these non-local encodings that every time you create a fermion, you need to touch some extensive number of things, maybe logarithmically extensive, but still in the number of qubits that you have, the number of modes that you have, you're gonna to touch something that scales with that. We can think about local fermion encodings. And this goes back to uh, Bravi and Katev's paper in uh, 2000, uh, 2000, I think, 2000, 2001. Um, in any case, in this paper, what they're looking at, what they were thinking about at that time, so there's a Tor code that Katev um, invented or you know, studied deeply. Um, and around this time, they're also thinking about fermionic encodings. And this is an encoding that's right on the edge of the Tor code. And so what that's gonna mean is that we're gonna introduce a Tor code. So let's just take a detour, remind everyone or teach everyone a little bit about the Tor code. The Tor code is a model that people use for encoding, um, for, for doing error correction and, and having quantum memory, um, for having quantum error correction, surface codes, Tor codes, all these nice things. Um, and what the crux of the Tor code is, is that we have, instead of having um, a lattice of qubits on site, so each X, I mean, each crossing point, there is no qubit, rather we're gonna put the qubits on the edges. So these qubits on edges, um, and then we're gonna create these two types of operators. We're gonna create this, this uh, 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 plaquette operator, which is X's around um, an empty space and a vertex operator, which is Z's around a cross, a crossing. Okay. And these two operators commute with one another um, because um, ZZ commutes with XX. So these are all nice at commuting. You make a Hamiltonian out of this and that's effectively a Tor code. It's a lot of beautiful things about the generacy, beautiful things about error correction, logical spaces, very interesting things that if you're interested, feel free to read much more. But to give you just a tip of the iceberg about how this works um, is that, um, again, we have these X type errors. So we, these X type errors can be detected by vertex stabilizers. So this vertex stabilizer will detect that there's an error that occurred at this vertex. And if there's an error that's at this space, then we'll detect the Z type error, the fluxes, which are like magnetic fields, these will be detected by, uh, by these X operators, by these plaquette stabilizers, this should be. Um, there's some exchange statistics of how these errors, these types of errors, this um, E error and the M error. So M representing magnetic flux, E representing electrical charge. Um, and if we put the E and M charge together um, from the Tor code, we get back something that's fermionic. Okay, this is really what we wanted. You know, like I said, it's talking about simulating fermions. Now we're looking at non-local encodings and we're gonna simulate these fermions with our non-local encoding, um, just using effectively a Tor code. Um, one more thing that's interesting about the Tor code, and this connects to also a very beautiful area of physics, if you guys are interested in these, um, in these string net models. So string net models are all um, very closely connected that you have these strings connecting to excitations. That if I have an excitation, uh, um, a flux excitation, it can be connected to a second flux excitation where each one of these, um, yeah. And if you have a charge excitation, they're connected through some, some line of error, some line of defects. And so you have this very nice picture of how to move it. So if I apply an X, a Z um, operation on this particular on this particular edge, then this particular um, defect will be corrected. And then it'll be minus, plus, 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 and then it becomes minus, minus, and then this plaquette satisfied, but then there'll be an error here. So you can move these errors around and start talking about how this, uh, this also affects the structure of, of excitations and errors. Okay, I think that's about all we need. Um, now, what we can do with this is actually build off of it. So as I mentioned, Bravi Katev in 2002, um, wrote a very nice paper where they're looking at how to actually code using this something very close to this Tor code. Um, and what they do instead of the Tor code exactly, so you have edge and vertex operators. The vertex operator is exactly the same as the vertex operator of the Tor code. The edge operator is deformed such that you always move a pair uh, a charge excitation and a flux excitation together. So this edge operator makes sure that they remain connected and the vertex operator is the same as before. Now we associate each fermionic mode to a vertex of the graph and then we put in edges such that we can move those vertices around. 
Um, and the details of how we actually connect the vertices to the edges and the edges to the sites depends a little bit on, on which approach you take. But at the heart of all these approaches, um, Bravi Katev, we generalized this um, in 2019 um, in what's called generalized superfast encoding, um, which is the title here. And then um, in 2020, last year, uh, my graduate student, Riley Sheehan, um, just was playing around with this and continued to play around with this. The pandemic hit and he did nothing but play around with this. And um, he came up with a very nice generalization of these custom fermion codes that really allow you to generalize both um, approaches to uh, local fermionic encodings. That's a little advertisement for that paper. Okay. Um, the crux of this and really connecting this back to uh, a very beautiful area of research is this uh, lattice gauge theory. So lattice gauge theories, you put matter fields at the vertices. So, it, no, excuse me. When you're not doing gauge theory, you put matter fields at the vertex. When you're doing gauge field, you don't pay attention to where the matter is at. You pay attention to things around it. So the, the connection that you can think um, from your e &M class, brushing it off a little bit, is that if I have a charge, I can talk about where the charges are. If I have a magnetic flux, I can talk about what the line of flux is. Um, but then, you know, in your second chapter, whatever e &M course you take, you also find out about Gauss's, Gauss's law, we have a Gaussian surface. And you talk about Ampyrean loops, we have a loop around, um, around some magnetic flux. And then at the Ampyrean loop, you know, you can check the Ampyrean loop, we check the, the, the Gaussian surface. And this gives a whole nother way of talking about electricity and magnetism. And what you should think is that this vertex operator, looking at all the, all the, um, all the lines going around some charge, is that we're actually checking whether there's a charge within that surface. And that is basically Gauss's law. The same, same idea for, um, for checking an Ampyrean loop to see if there's a flux coming through um, the surface. Um, but one word that I would like to highlight here is lattice gauge theory. Um, and I think it's really important that we highlight this word lattice here because this connects back to the earlier question about the difference between first and second quantization. Um, where we're really talking about whether using a lattice or whether using a set of basis functions. Ooh, this looks terrible, we're gonna skip that. Um, Riley did a very nice way of uh, mapping uh, gauge qubits to, uh, fermionic qubits to gauge qubits, but it's distorted, so we'll wait till that paper comes out. <laughs> um, okay, don't, don't worry about that too much. Um, what I'd like to highlight instead is um, some of the consequences of this local encoding and how it compares against our non-local encodings like Jordan Wigner. Um, please forgive me, there's not, uh, there's not text here, um, but this BKSF, this is a non-local encoding. The auxiliary fermion, the, the Jordan Wigner and the BKSF are all just local encodings of different sizes. So it's not super important that you follow what all, they, all of them are. Um, what I would like to note is the auxiliary fermion and the BKSF are, are both um, non-local encodings where you, you need to encode, um, you need to encode the system inside of some way that's very close to this gauge picture. Um, where now, in order to check whether there's a fermion, um, I'm not looking over the whole lattice, but rather I'm looking locally to see if there's a fermion. So I need to look at both a, a, a plaquette operator as well as a vertex operator, and that tells me if there's a fermion present or not. But now I can do all my manipulations locally. That's why it's called local transformations. So here you can see that all the methods that scale with the number of qubits, well, you know, this is just on a square lattice uh, of the Hubbard model. Um, the size of the encoding grows for these non-local encodings. You see this fixed for some particular size. So above certain lattice width, um, both of these methods are, are much better. Okay, and this, this is on a lattice, um, uh, on a grid, right? So it's a uh, two-dimensional grid, I believe. Uh, this is also work with, um, what? I didn't cite it, it's okay. This is also work from our group. Uh, this is also work from our group where we're looking at the atomization energy six. So it's a molecular ensemble of just these six molecules. And the idea of this molecular ensemble is that you should check what the atomization energy is. So it's saying, if I have um, uh, so S2, um, then I wanna know what the energy of the sulfur atom is versus the energy of two, the energy of two sulfur atoms versus the energy of the sulfur um, molecule. Um, and, and so this is just a set of molecules and we just played around, we put this in to look at the Jordan Wigner and this uh, BKSF, which is the non-local encodings. And these are different orbital rotations, not particularly important. Uh, what you see is this trend indicates that there's a huge difference between this Bravigatev super fast transform, which is this non-local encoding and the local encoding. The local encoding is doing much better in terms of the number of gates, the tensor weight. Um, and so Jordan Wigner is much, much better. And it took us a while to appreciate why. And um, 
The next model that we looked at, so this is also Riley Shin's uh, work. So Canal Satia was uh, working on this project before. Riley came in, we had a number of people in between, postdoc, Sha Jue, and Tarini Hardikar, who's actually doing her PhD at uh, Berkeley now. Um, uh, yeah, so what we did to kind of test out this idea to see why did, why did these perform so much better or worse, um, this OSC is uh, super fast encoding. Um, this is this, also this non-local encoding. And what we noticed is we took these different hydrogen chains, H10, the green one, and this purple one are a 10, 10 site, um, are 10 hydrogens, uh, six hydrogens and two hydrogens. And you can see how this scales as a function of the orbital exponents. The orbital exponent is determining how tightly, how tight this exponent, uh, excuse me, how tight this basis function is. So we take a very, very large orbital exponent, then we're going to this basis that's a delta function basis. This is what I mentioned is where you might use first quantization, where then orbital m corresponds to location um, in R3. Whereas right now, if you take the, the red um, delocalized orbital exponent where it's a very small value, then it doesn't really make sense to talk about this being localized at some position in R3, rather it's delocalized over some collection of sites or so. And what we can see is that as this orbital exponent gets larger, the um, super fast encoding does much, much better. Um, and, and we're thinking about why um, and how we can explain this and how this relates back to locality. And so one of the things that I started playing around with just this week, and in fact, I'm very happy to present these results. Um, I guess it's not very much results, but um, thinking about this completely delocalized toy model. So this completely delocalized toy model, what we're gonna do is actually take a complete graph. And this is saying, um, so just backing up one more step here. So here, what we think is happening um, is that for all these different molecules, the orbitals that describe the S orbital, the P orbital, and the D orbitals of the valence are very large. So that means that every orbital sees every other orbital. So the P orbital of this sulfur sees the, the D orbital of this sulfur. The S orbital of hydrogen sees the S orbital of this hydrogen, and so on and so forth. So all of these orbitals are very large compared to the spatial extent of uh, compared to space, right? So there's, they're just considerably large orbitals. Um, and we can change the, the width of each orbital by changing its orbital exponent. We did that for this hydrogen lattice. And we saw that when the hydrogen lattice has very tight orbitals, then um, the super fast encoding makes much more sense. This, this local encoding works much better. So now if we consider a situation where there's no notion of a lattice, this is completely throwing away the notion of a lattice is saying that everything's connected to everybody. You know, the distance to go from any site to another is exactly the same one. So everyone's exactly the same distance away from everyone else. And so I think of this as a completely delocalized model. And this toy model is something that I was just thinking about this week, just started playing around with, threw it into, into, um, into PySCF, ran a few codes. And what we find is that there's no Hartree-Fock error. Right? This is really cool, I think because it's a very, way, very good way of thinking about um, when Hartree-Fock works and when it doesn't, and not just a good way of thinking about it, but also a quantitative way of thinking about it. So this model is, is what you can think is what happens when the basis sets are so large that every single basis set looks almost exactly the same. There's very small asymmetry between the different points um, that you can pick inside of space. Um, and so we can see that the Hartree-Fock error goes to zero if it's completely symmetric, every orbit looks exactly the same, doesn't matter um, what happens. Um, there's some really nice intuition here. So you can think that the Hartree-Fock approximation, if you know it, um, is a mean field approximation. And by mean, I mean average. So it's an average um, over the electron-electron interaction. And so what happens in the case that we take a complete graph, the um, average interaction of this site, for instance, is the same as the average interaction of this site because every single site looks exactly the same. So every single site is seeing n minus one, the effect of n minus one identical sites on itself. And so there's no Hartree-Fock error for this particular instance. Uh, what's really cool is one of my longtime collaborators, Zoltan Zimborish, has been working on mathematical physics since I've known him. And um, one of the uh, important results they had a few years ago was a fermionic definite theorem. So these definite theorems are from probability, where it's thinking about what happens when you have permutationally invariant states. And you can make a lot of arguments about what happens to probability functions. And you can import all these ideas from probability functions to quantum domain, and you end up with fermionic, uh, quantum, and I guess bosonic definite theorems. Um, and these definite theorems give a, a quantitative link to the quality of Hartree-Fock approximations. So um, in some sense, 
we're thinking about what happens as the basis set becomes delocalized, well, the graph becomes complete. So every orbital is interacting with every other orbital. And then as this graph complete becomes complete, the mean field becomes exact, because it's not entirely true, because even as the graph becomes complete, it's still asymmetric. So how much the asymmetry is going to ruin the ability to use Definetti theorems is fair enough. Um, and so that's why it's in red. It's hypothesis is a question about how far we can push these results quantitatively. But this gives a very nice connection to what makes quantum simulation hard from the other direction. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, wrap it up. It's another four minutes left. And so we have a little bit of space for questions. So a key takeaway from this is that the basis set affects which fermion the qubit transform is preferred. So if we're using something that's a, a lattice function, a, a basis set that's very close to lattice, then using a lattice, the gauge lattice transformation will make a lot of sense. However, if we have orbitals that are very delocalized, then it's not much improvement over, over the, um, the Jordan Wigner and the Hartree Fock is if, if the orbital size extends over the entire simulation domain, then every orbital is gonna see every orbital anyways, and there's no real point in using um, a lattice gauge simulation because there's no, no notion of local, local um, transformations. So we are hypothesizing that delocalized basis sets imply better mean field results. Um, one of our graduate students, Wei Shi Wang, is um, working on a, a, a very nice test suite of using basis sets and, and basis sets designs that will allow us to test this relatively easily. Um, the next steps are looking at real systems with delocalized basis sets. So taking an, an ordinary basis set, STO3G or CCPPZ, and just extending that basis set and seeing if as we make the basis set larger and, and, and increase this, decrease the orbital exponent and allow these orbitals to become larger, do we expect that it gets closer to a symmetric graph and consequently have better mean field results? So these are questions that I don't know the answer to. This completely delocalized model, um, right now it's a complete graph where all the interactions are the same strength. What happens when it's a complete graph with different, with varying strengths of the interaction? That's something very close to this SKY model. Um, which is studied for um, strange metals and a lot of other interesting areas. Um, we studied that inside of our paper on uh, custom fermion codes. It's just a toy model to kind of look at what happens. And so we'll return to that, thinking about what happens when mean field becomes exact or does it not become exact? There's ways that we can kind of play around and understand that. The, the broader goal of this entire inquiry is just understanding where quantum computers help with quantum chemistry. And this comes down to also thinking about what basis set we're using. Um, if we use um, a linear, if we have a system that's well described by a linear set of basis functions, then DMRG matrix product states will work very well. Um, in the broader context, just to kind of put everything into a, a nicer big picture, so Hartree Fox solutions are MP hard. This is something I actually proved results in Zimboris um, a number of years ago. Well, I've updated some of these results with uh, Sahil Galania, um, and uh, you can find these in archive. But the hartree fock goal is to approximate the two-body interactions of the ground state with the free fermion solution. Um, free fermions, if you're a free fermion Hamiltonian, you can diagonalize it and you can evolve under it efficiently. Um, there's certain things you can't do as far as measurements go, but nonetheless, the idea, um, going back to the beginning of the talk, is that you can do this efficiently. The hartree fock error, which is the error in the solution of the hartree fock versus the solution to the exact problem, uh, vanishes when the interaction is completely delocalized and completely symmetric. So this is also an interesting point that while the hartree fock might be NP-complete, it's still very easy to know um, when this becomes exact approximation. And there's some other papers that go back to um, Elliot Lieb going back to the 60s or 80s, um, also thinking about the approximation of hartree fock um, And then just kind of to, to remind everyone, uh, finding the ground states of interacting systems generically QMA hard, QMA hard, is problems that are going to be hard for a BQP quantum computer. So it means that quantum computers are not expected to find the ground states of interacting systems any more than classical systems. Okay, and with that, let me just summarize. Let me say thank you to the Department of Energy. You guys funded me, the National Science Foundation. QBrate, I'm actually no longer there, but uh, it's a nice website. Um, I meant to move that logo, but it is what it is. Uh, the summary of the talk is that we've talked about quantum simulation anti-symmetric subspaces custom fermionic codes for local fermionic descriptions. And we started thinking about how basis sets in the complete interaction graph interact. So um, a little bit over. No worries. Thank you, James. It's a very nice talk. We'll virtually clap. Um, let me uh, take a minute just to see if there are any questions from the audience here for James. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, 
I'm Jacob from the University of Maryland. Um, I recently read your uh, Jordan Riley's paper on the custom fermionic codes, um, and I guess you didn't speak a whole lot to this, so I apologize if this is a fairly detailed question. So that's just whatever level makes sense. But um, in these local encodings, one of the important pieces is using this tort code model where you're in this su code subspace, right, to have the correct fermionic um, re relations. Um, and in that paper, you do discuss a little bit state preparation, but I'm curious how hard state prep is in these generalizations of this custom fermionic codes. So you speak to it on a square lattice, um, but it was unclear to me from reading the paper how hard I should think this um, state prep step should be um, in general. Um, so if you're able to talk, speak to that. Yeah. So that makes sense. Whatever makes sense for this audience. Thank uh, you. I mean, I can answer it just relatively easily. Um, well, not super easy, but I can answer it. Um, please forgive these logos. It's supposed to turn off and uh, this is small typos. Um, and this also is the appendix. So it's nice that you asked this question because we have lots of appendices that are <laughs> waiting. Um, so the idea is that to do the encoding for the state itself is that you can actually decide how much you want to block and code these, these, uh, these different levels. And what you can actually think of is that this is really the MARA uh, construction. So if you apply the first order MARA, um, the first order MARA step, and second order, third order, so on and so forth, then you're getting rid of local correlations. And so you're making a more entangled initial state. So the idea is that how much entanglement you put in the initial state is how, how non-local, how much you've actually encoded these, um, these uh, these states into into this non into this, into the local operators, right? So if we don't do any any encoding, then we don't need many qubits. But then we're going to have to do Jordan Wigner map across the whole thing, right? So no vacuum entanglement. Then we get this non-local operation between these this just Jordan Wigner link. But then if we have um, a vacuum entanglement, then we get completely local operators. And as I said, with this mirror construction, we get a very nice mapping from you know completely. Um, local operators, completely delocal operators, and, and this is, um, it's, it's in the end of the paper. I think there should be a new version posted on the archive soon. But uh, certainly feel free to ask more questions, uh, follow up if this didn't make sense. Yeah, one follow up. Um, and I'm not super familiar with the details of how uh, the mirror construction works. Um, I generally understand it. But I mean, how hard is it when I can consider I right, consider these custom graphs in the context of architectural constraints. Um, so how hard is it actually to do this mirror framework in like, i.e. this like heavy hexagon model or something, right? As opposed to when I have these nearest neighbor lattice. Um, is there any difficulty there or not really? Uh, I don't think there's any major difficulties. There's, we did a small toy example at the end of that paper. Um, so you might have a look. I think it was actually the, the, the heavy lattice uh, from IBM. But we didn't investigate it much further than that. So it's actually a really nice project if you think of things to do. Um, feel free to you know, attack it and let me know how it goes. But yeah, I don't think there's any major hurdles there. I think it may be a question of, again, as, as I was pointing out to this talk, maybe a question of whether that makes sense versus Jordan Wigner, right? And you can even think of you know, how much entanglement you need to generate. If you need to generate a large amount of entanglement, then it may be very difficult to do anyways on something like an IBM device where you have so much noise. Um, there's also a notion of using these, these codes um, as a way of doing error correction or at least error detection, error mitigation, um, because this is very close to the TOR code for error correction. So there's also some ways that we might be able to use this on an actual IBM device to actually mitigate errors. And so this is something else that we have as an ongoing project. Thanks, Thanks James. And we've got hopefully two quick questions left to close out. I'll start with uh, Ali, he's got his hand raised. Um. Thanks. Uh, I just had a quick question about this uh, in the regimes that with this non-local thing maybe not being useful. So I was wondering, is there a regime that this, what if basically I don't use any encoding at all? Like if I just look at the Hamiltonian as a sparse Hamiltonian and just simulate that, is there a regime that not encoding in any like Qubit encoding is better than encoding Jordan Wigner or local encoding? Um, so I think the problem is if you don't encode it at all, like really do no encoding, then what you end up with is the Hamiltonian, just this Hamiltonian with no encoding, 
contains all these subspaces. So you'd be simulating the bosonic and the fermionic subspaces if you do no encoding at all. No, but like, but yeah, maybe non-encoding is not the right word. Like, let's say I use the second quantization form for like labeling the basis of states using occupation number. And yeah. then I just look at the matrix elements of Hamiltonian in that basis. And then I get a sparse Hamiltonian with like this anti-symmetric thing encoded in the element. Right. Sure. And then I, I just mean, simulate that Hamiltonian. Yeah. I mean, them. there's 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 papers on this. So, um, um, I cannot say this guy's name is Boglugi, something like this. And um, and Peter Love wrote a paper. I guess never got published, but maybe ten years ago, um, mm -hmm. looking at um, doing uh, sparse encoding. So just in, like you said, encoding the matrix elements within the anti-symmetric subspace. So you know you do the so you have your, your set of slated determinants, and then you just project this the set of slated determinants into um, into the basis. You have m choose n of them, and then you take this as sparse matrix and do the time evolution there. There's a lot of papers thinking about this. So whether it works or not, a lot of these methods that really do these sparse encodings end up being very costly to set up on a quantum device. You need you know your select and prepare. You need a lot of different parts to get the thing to work, right? So I, I think it's very hard to actually see how to implement it on a quantum device. Not saying that it might not make more sense asymptotically. So in fact, the first quantization will probably make more sense asymptotically, but you need it to be large enough that the basis set size, um, you know, works. Yeah. That's to say there are some small experiments there. And I think it's an interesting open question about whether it just makes sense to do the sparse evolution or if it makes sense to do the encoding and then some, some more intelligent Evolution. I don't think there's a right answer there, other than test and check. I see. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. And then one last question from uh, Yasik. I see up as his hand raised. Hey, James. Thanks for for your uh, presentation. It was um, very very uh, interesting. <clears throat> my question is uh, comments maybe. I was, I'm not sure if I understood everything. But by the way, my background is quantum chemistry, so of course I'm kind of like more interest, you know, focus on that part. But uh, when you said um, that you are distorting your, your basic set Gaussians. I'm not sure if this is really, you know, very helpful in a sense in reducing error because, you know, those basis, basis are you typically, you know, like optimized to describe some, you know, atoms. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but what I'm trying to say is that, of course, you can add the, you know, the expanded, you know, uh, additional Gaussian, additional basis set to, towards the, this, you know, complete basis set limit. You're always free to do that, or if you don't want to do that because you know this adds you know the the you know the <coughs> computation. But you can what you can do you can come up also with the combination of the bases, right? They may be localized, but then you can transform. You're free to transform them any way you want, right? So you can mm -hmm. pick up instead of having one individual on on each hydrogen, you can have you know eight different combination of them, and they will it's equivalent and they will be delocalized. So maybe that might be helpful because you know I think it's if we just you know expand the you know exponent. Or decrease or increase, then that's kind of distorting. And I'm not sure if it's really yeah. helpful with getting with reducing the error. I actually think it's kind of that does the opposite. So that's just a comment. Yeah. yeah no, I think it's a great comment, and and it's certainly one that I had to disabuse my graduate students because they're like, this is going to make the error worse, right? So this this is just looking at the orbital exponent and the average tensor weight, but the error, as you said, is not at all in this plot, right? So I mean, when you're distorting basis functions, basis functions were selected for a particular reason. Um, we're playing around this in theory because there's a question of, of, of what happens, what happened in this case. We used an actual basis that I think it was um, either STO3G or one of the CCPVTZ basis sets. But nonetheless, what you can see is that because the orbitals are very delocalized, very large S orbitals, um, they end up interacting. The interaction graph is really large. Um, but what I'm trying to say is you can always, you know, use the same, you know, localized basis set and you can make any combination of them and then treat them as your basis set, right? As your basis <laughs> set. And it will be delocalized, right? If that's what you want, right? They will be localized, you know, any way you want. So you can you can transform, you know, the, the basis set, but, you know, to whatever you want. I mean, if you know... By, by transforming, I mean, you know, linear transformation, right? So yeah. As a chemist, right, you should appreciate this plot. I mean, this is... The, um, the canonical symmetrized orbitals, the symmetric uh, atomic orbitals, and the molecular orbital orbitals, right? right. So this is the rotations of the basis, but it right. didn't affect much the actual scaling properties of the system, right? So we we're thinking the same thing when I first came across these results, was can we just localize the orbitals? But I think it might be something deeper than that. I'm not sure. I mean, it's still an act of investigation, kind of what's causing this to be so bad 
at this uh, at these regimes where you really get a huge um, several orders of mag or at least an order of magnitude difference between um, these two different methods. Uh, I, I think the point is not so much that we want to distort this, but when we think of what people are applying quantum computers to, a lot of it is model systems, right? So we think of um, the Hubbard model. This is not close to any quantum chemistry model, but this is extremely local. When we talk of strong correlation, it's because these two electrons are at the same site that we have strongly correlated systems. And so as we move away from that, then you have these very ability to have delocalized orbitals, of course, localized ones too. And as you said, I think the electronic structure of the system will dictate which basis that makes the most sense. Um, and we're just playing around with these ideas now to try and see if we can understand. Sure, of course, yeah, it's always helpful to, I like to play with toy ideas. You know, they're always helpful. You can distort them any way you want, right? But yeah, so. Yeah, and then connect back to reality as we go back. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, with that, uh, James, I really appreciate you sticking around for an extra 10 minutes to answer these uh, nice questions for a very nice talk. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.